As a libertarian, Dr. Friedman believes in the maximum possible freedom for the individual. Yet he also recognizes the need for certain government functions. Which functions? How does he decide when it's legitimate for the government to take some of our freedom away? Dr. Friedman and I won't be talking about motorcycle helmets, but we will be discussing the larger issues of how a libertarian looks at public safety, protecting the environment, or deciding the right size of government itself. We begin by asking Dr. Friedman just what is a libertarian? The typical definition of libertarianism, in my mind, is that a libertarian wants the smallest, least intrusive government consistent with consider consistent with the maximum freedom for each individual to follow his own ways, his own values, as long as he doesn't interfere with anybody else's doing the same. Okay, consistent with the maximum freedom of each individual as long as he doesn't interfere with under other individuals pursuing their own freedom. But as a matter of fact, there are two really different versions of libertarianism. The more extreme version of libertarianism has one central principle. It is, it is immoral to initiate force on anyone else. That's the prime view. That's the prime, that's the Ayn Rand type libertarianism. So the coercive power of the state is immoral in and of immoral itself. Immoral in and of itself. And you and don't... All you need to know to know that something of the state is immoral is whether it involves the initiation of force. That's one brand. Now there's another brand, which is one I would uh, be favorable to, which you could call consequentialist libertarianism. And it's the one you've just defined. Oh, well, you've just defined it, but thank you. I'll take the credit. I see the way you work with graduate students. <laughs> now, if I may, let me take you through a series of questions that are floating around in the modern mind and ask how a libertarian addresses them. Question number one, the environment. Now, it would strike a lot of people living in Manhattan that Central Park is very important to their lives and that if Milton Friedman had his way, it would be turned over to the market and buried under skyscrapers and parking lots within 18 months or however long it takes Donald Trump to put the structures up. It doesn't take a, uh, a governmental agency to maintain the theaters in New York. It doesn't take a government agency to maintain the, the, the museums, the art museums in New York. The Museum of Modern Art is not a government museum, it's a private it happens to be there are two kinds. There are private for-profit enterprises or not, not for-profit enterprises, like the museum, like the opera house, and so on. Right. In the same way, if, if Central Park were not owned by the government, it never would have become the filthy place it became. You forget what happened to Central Park. Uh, we, for years, for some years, a long, long time ago, lived uh, on Central Park West. When we were in New York, this was pretty good address. during the war. Well, even, even then it was a very good it, address. It wasn't a bad address, but it wasn't particularly good. All right. But we were able to take our children down to the park and when our, they were babies and, and let them, leave them with a teenage sitter. And nobody was worried about safety. But in more recent years, until the very recent years, Central Park came to be a place where you wouldn't dare to do that. It wasn't safe. That was because it was a government park. The central principle is that nobody takes care of somebody else's property as well as he takes care of his own. If Central Park were privately owned, it would be advantageous to provide recreational spaces. Now, you just touched on something very important, because one of the things I'm trying to distinguish here is the extent to which your libertarianism is effectively a moral position. You do it because it's right and just. It creates the greatest conditions of justice. And the extent to which you do it, because it works. And it sounds to me as though you have both reasons pretty well wrapped up. Absolutely. If it didn't work, the main thing is, if it didn't work, it would be an impossible goal. The only reason there's any chance of keeping government limited is because government is so inefficient and does so poorly. Right. Now let me just try... During the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, government in Britain was very limited, and economic enterprise went all but unregulated. Yet that wasn't exactly a golden age, now was it? Again and again and again you'll hear we've tried, the Western world has already tried laissez-faire, letter-rip economics, and it ended up with the London that Charles Dickens portrayed dirty 
filthy, child labor, uh, just a terrible mess. How, what, what do you do? With, what, what, how did it that was, come to be? It was a terrible mess, but what cleaned it up? Israeli and his social, the, 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 the child labor laws? and No, no. no what cleaned it up was the uh, progress of private enterprise because you had a... The reason it was so messy was because you had to burn coal. And the kind of coal that was available in Britain was very smoky and messy. And once you were able to use uh, oil, natural gas, better furnaces, all of those things is what made it possible to clean uh, uh, London up. Now, so far as child labor is concerned, right. uh, what happens is, what happens in the picture that's drawn of Britain of the 19th century, right. is that there is no image of what went before. Of why is it that all of these people from the farming, from the agri rural areas came to the city? Did they come to the city because they thought it would be worse or because they thought it would be better? And was it worse or was it better? Uh, in the early days, there, you know, there are no, very few things that are 100% black or 100% white. Right. There are various shades of gray. And what we aim for is the least shade of gray that's possible. I'm not going to say that all was rosy in Britain at that time. It wasn't. But w look around the world today. Where is at least rosy? In those countries where things are run by the government, not in those countries where private enterprise are. I'm so you're, you're and the same thing was true in Britain. The conditions on the in the rural areas on the farms were far worse than the conditions in the city, but they were not visible. Mm. They're hidden. Nobody saw them. Dickens, Once they come Dickens to the city, didn't, Dickens didn't stroll around the country. He didn't with his stroll, notebook right. His All right. So what you're saying then is that this mental image that drives even to this day so much of the environmental debate is simply. It may be true as far as it goes, but you'd advise greater historical understanding. But not only historical, present. Where are the most polluted areas in the world? Today. Today. In Russia. Russia? Right. Why? Because everything in Russia was controlled by the government. There was no, and I keep emphasizing, nobody is going to take care of somebody else's property as well as he'll take care of his own.